am Party People, episode 101 of the Hudak Confessional Podcast. We are so, ooh, ooh, ooh. so close to the playoffs, but don't get too excited. You got one game left, and you better not sleep on this one because we want to get Dome Field at least the first game. We want to get that home game so the crowd can help take us through the wild card because I can't, we haven't lost a wild card at home under Sean Payton, I'm pretty sure. So get that wild card, go home. Let's play some football. A lot of good things happening. A lot of some bad things. Don't worry, fans. We're not freaking out. So y'all shouldn't freak out. We're going to go over the injury report. We're going to go over news. We're going to preview this Tampa Bay Buccaneers game. And then first of all, though, we're going to give some big hoodats out there. Ozzy, Haley Beard, Brandon, Brian Maduku, Lula, T-Mama always out there with us. Noah, Shane, uh, Joe, heck, everybody out there. Shane Rodriguez, Lynn, Cynthia, Derek, everybody out there who that's y'all i'm so happy and t mom if you can't see me i don't know what's going on because everybody else can see me so i don't know you you zoom out i ain't zooming out you zoom out <laughs> who is that's it, all is it us there. no it's not us man it's not it, it's t uh... but we love her anyway how you doing Elias? man i'm doing i'm doing great today man got a little bit spunk and yeah. I, I feel good about the week. Good? I think I'm uh yeah, I feel man, great, man. Not, I, I, I hear the feedback as I refresh, and it looks anyway. like we're good. Oh, um, <laughs> mute that tab, bro. Yeah. Mute that tab. It's <laughs> muted, man. I, I had to make sure that it wasn't us. Like that kind of that kind of announcement always makes me look inward. So oh, I had to right. refresh and check, and I'm like, no, I look pretty clear. You look pretty clear. Oh, I look drop dead. Not see it's, it's, look. That, it's that new Pelicans hat right here that my wife got me for Christmas. It's yeah. looking fresh. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I don't – from here, from here, that borderline looks like a Panthers hat. Okay, look, you know I would not disrespect our fans by rocking a Panthers hat. But anyway, <laughs> let, let's talk. I heard. Maurice said – he said he told us 12-4 and four, we're almost there. We are almost there, and I'm excited because we got a lot it, – it's a lot of stuff going on. Before we start talking about the Bucks, let's go ahead and hit the injury report, brother. Hiloiki Kaha gets Go put on that. IR. And two things, they yep. signed Kasim Edabali, who uh, a lot of Saints fans remember who came on after Junior Gallette left. He's out of Boston College. He's one of those guys that I selected them to pick in the seventh round going way back a few drafts ago. We ended up getting him as an undrafted free agency. He's back. He spent time with the Broncos, spent time with the Cat, uh, with the Rams this year. Now he's back with the Saints. And then I also think with him going on IR, Kikaha that is, could signal that Trey Hendrickson is close to returning. Uh, most of the Saints officials seem to have a higher grade on Hendrickson this year in terms of playing time than Kikaha did. So if they were able to get rid of Kikaha, well, not get rid of him, but they felt comfortable putting him on IR, I think that means that we might be seeing Trey Hendrickson pretty soon. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, man. They said Trey should be out about three, week, three weeks um, after the initial ankle injury. Uh, you would have liked to maybe get him practicing this week to get him in some limited role so he can kind of hit the ground running before the playoffs. Yeah. And yet, you know, you make this move knowing that you've, number one, got a guy that's familiar uh, with the scheme coming in, having played with us a couple of years back. And then also, again, as you say, the likelihood that Hendrickson is almost ready to return. So you feel a lot better about that move. Yeah, I think Kasim Adabali just basically becomes a depth sign. They're trying to continually beef up that D-line because if you're going to win the playoffs, you win in the trenches. Uh, everybody loves to talk about quarterback. You do. Their receiver's great, but you win in the trenches. I mean, that, that's how you do a long playoff run, get deep in there, and then get your quarterback to the Super Bowl to maybe win you some games. See, so, yeah, I understand it. Um, let's go over the full – Injury report, guys, you're going to see it in your background as I scroll through it. You see Brandon Coleman has returned to practice. Uh, a lot of y'all might not care, but I care. I think that's important. Uh, Teron Armstead did not practice today. Hello, Kikaha, who's put on IR, obviously did not pra uh, practice. Michael Human Nawanui, he did not practice due to his concussion. If he has not practiced at this point, I don't believe he'll play. Trey Henderson still did not practice. However, Brandon Coleman is practicing. Michael Thomas, Josh Hill, Senio Kelamente, Ryan Ramchek, and Garrett Griffin on a limited basis. On the Tampa Bay Buccaneers side, uh, Devontae Bond. Their linebacker did not practice, as well as Chris Godwin, that rookie wide receiver. Cameron Brait, Robert Ayers, Levante David, Deshaun Jackson, and Gerald McCoy all practiced it on a limited basis. So there is our injury update for today. We will get one final one tomorrow that Elias and I will discuss on Twitter. 
But there you go. That's the injuries. Uh, and like I said, on the Kikaha thing, I hate it for him. You know, I was in- interested to see how he would do getting possibly more snaps with the injuries the team has had. But him going to IR, his season is now over. And for those of you mm-hmm. who did miss it, the Saints are actually set John Kuhn designated to return from IR. Uh, as of now, they have, I believe, three weeks that they have to activate him. But they can keep him practicing as long as he doesn't play a game in those three weeks, they can evaluate him, and he's a potential guy to bring in for the playoffs, add a little grit, win some of those trench warfare things I've been saying. So, Yeah, so so two things on that, two things, and one because Shane ended up asking about it and we discussed it earlier, who plays Sam linebacker? And my initial thought was that obviously you have to give Monty those Sam linebacker snaps because he's technically the only one on the roster. But clearly you went to Kikaha when you did and and asked him to go back to playing Sam because you didn't want to have to deal with the attrition. Plus, Kikaha is a better player than Monty on the field. So now that you're having to see Monty probably have to take some of those snaps, it also opens up the fact that much time in base either. And you start to you kind of have to argue, do I want to play Monty? A little bit more or do i maybe play those three safety sets a little bit more and you play bush down um a little bit more so i think you kind of have to mix and match you still get monty playing that that uh that sound position but i don't i think you end up spending less time in base um, well, well let me also throw out there that even though kikaha was quote unquote playing sam they weren't really playing him as sam a lot i mean they did drop him back some, but in the same degree that they were dropping back Cameron Jordan on some pass plays, he was really playing up as a stand-up D lineman, not a true 4-3 Sam linebacker. I mean, so I think there's a significant difference that we have to point out there that he wasn't playing A.J. Klein's role as a Sam. And I think that's very right. important to point out. What you really see the Saints doing now is they're just playing some straight nickel as a base. Go back to what they were doing about three years ago where nickel was their base defense. And that's what I've seen the most the past two weeks. I think that's what you'll continue to see. And you might see guys like Malty see the field, but overall I think you'll continue to see nickel and dime be the base as they move forward and rely on heavy defensive lineman sets with a lot of extra bulk at the D line to make up for the absence of linebackers. Yeah, that's that was my thought process. Maybe you see um, more nickel and possibly more dime with the five-man fronts that we were using. The second part to that is uh, – Armstead. So we we just discussed about the, the playoffs being won via the trenches. And I think the main ingredient to the, the Saints having a deep playoff run is to have a healthy offensive line. Do you think this is a game you give Armstead a week to rest to have him ready mm. for the playoff game? I personally, and this is how I would play the game. I'm not saying how Sean Payton's going to do it. Personally, I would say no. Don't rest. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, obviously, there are people who disagree with that line of thinking. You you look at Sean McVay, young coach in the league, the youngest coach in the league. He's choosing to rest his Week 17 guys because, regardless, he thinks it's better to go into the wild card and playoffs healthy than it is to secure seeding, which I think there's validity to that argument. For me, Armstead, uh, I realize he can get nicked up, and I realize we're better with him on the field. But I think for the Saints, you've still got something to play for. You've got to win this division. Seeing if the Saints lose and the Panthers win, they lose the division. I think it's still so important that they win. I think they have to go in and just play their hardest against the Bucs. Now, if you get up by multiple scores in the second half, sure, start resting some starters. But make sure you win this game before you worry about that. Yeah, and, and the reason I took that angle is, number one, the Bucs have the 32nd ranked uh, defense as far as pass rush productivity, yeah. they aren't getting very many sacks. I um, mean, they're, they're down a couple of players. And then the second thing is obviously Armstead is dealing with what has been kind of a prolonged injury. Um, as far as his his thighs, his hamstring, or the 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 leg injury that he's having, and so knowing that it's that type of game, and do you maybe do you see something as though where Armstead is active, but maybe purposes S- similar to what like Pete this. did a couple weeks ago uh, yeah and they kind of did that I think with Armstead early in the season so fair question something I thought about considering you know you need him healthy and I think the the majority of the offensive line is kind of getting back to health wise except for him 
And so that was why that kind of throw that I threw that out there. But I would be fine with him playing either way. Um, clearly, he helps the run game or the game. But I would also be hurt if he was lost for any significant time because that's a bigger blow to the offensive line than people are willing to admit. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I see both sides of that one. For me, it comes down to secure the division first. I mean, heck, even if it right. comes down to you look at the scoreboard and you see Atlanta is just whooping Cam Newton bad. I mean, Atlanta's up three scores in the third quarter. Fine. Whatever decision you need to make, just secure the division. I think that's more important. And one reason I'll say this is even though Pete is not as good at left tackle as Armstead is, and I think we can all agree to that, he's still good. Mm -hmm. He is a starter quality at left tackle. He's not his best there, but he's better than subpar. He's not like a backup left tackle. He has got some – he can play the position. He can do it admirably, uh, or better word, probably adequately. So I think you you run with a team that's going to win, and if Armstead, God forbid, gets injured for the playoffs, I think we're fine because you still plug Senio Calamante at left guard, Pete at left tackle. Play your best roster every game, especially from this point on. Don't let up. Play like every single down means this is going to cost me the Super Bowl if I don't convert it. So that means you got to have your best 22 on the field at all times. That's my thought. Obviously, others disagree with that, and that's fine. I think it, there's no one right answer to this question or questions like it. You can have multiple trains of thought and both be right. This is just how I would do it. Fair enough. So I, I would assume that because this is the next game coming, this should segue us into the into the Bucks coverage. So yeah. what do you what do you see for this game? What do you what do you what are you keying on for this game? How do you feel about this one? There's no reason the New Orleans Saints should not win and be able to rest their starters in the second half. No offense to the Bucks, but the the Saints have honestly dominated division teams this year. It, it's an anomaly. Yeah. I, I, neither you nor I expect it. I don't think anybody really expects it, and I know the Bucks are going to come in and play hard. I just don't think mm-hmm. they can keep up with New Orleans or beat New Orleans. Now, if New Orleans plays sloppy, if they don't execute well, if they fail to take advantage of mismatches and this game stays close, I still see the Saints winning. But if you look at how New Orleans has played, 15 games this year. There's nothing that you've seen in 15 games of tape, at least that I've studied in 15 games of Saints tape, that says they should have a problem with Tampa. Nothing. That's not a knock on Tampa. Tampa has some talent to pieces, but they're obviously not there yet, and that is attributed by the fact they've only won four games. Nothing says the Saints should struggle here. Yeah, you know, I'd have to agree, and I think the the main thing that I'm I'm focusing on right now is the Bucks are in complete disarray as a team. Um, the piece that I have coming out tomorrow will kind of focus on uh, the locker room issue that took place early in the week where one of the defensive linemen pretty much cost them the game versus the Panthers with a, uh, I think, an encroachment penalty. And it seems you've got you've got dysfunction in the locker room, but you've also got comments about John Gruden wanting to come back to Tampa. Well, he doesn't start making calls fielding to see if people will come back and, and, and coach with him if he feels that the coach for Tampa is uh, in a in a very firm, consistent place. I think Coda just released or just talked to the uh, uh, to reporters about how distracting it is hearing that he's lost the locker room. And here's the thing. Here's what we've learned in three years uh, in those three losing years. Every year at the end of the year, we had to hear about Sean Payton leaving. Those are things that don't happen unless there's a reason for them to happen. If we're winning, you don't hear about Sean. Yeah. Yeah, you you don't hear that. I hate that we hear that almost every year, but you are right. We don't hear that unless we're losing. I think you're seeing Winston play better quarter. He's making better decisions as a quarterback, throwing the ball, and yet he's still turning the ball over, which is a part of his DNA. Is who he is from college all the way till now. The guy is careless with the ball. Yeah. Um, this is a game that the Saints should win handedly because they are the better team and they have the better talent and they're the most stable and well coached. The Saints should not have a problem with the Bucks in any way, uh, either whether it was a home game or a away game. They should handedly take take. They should deal with the Bucks rather easily. Yeah, uh, this I mean, game. This, this is just how I'm feeling. 
One of my favorite football quotes is, you are who your record says you are. Just like we look back in New Orleans and we talk about the potential that last year's team had. They were still a 7-9 and nine team. There's no way to escape that they were not good. That's fine. There's potential there, mm-hmm. but that, that can happen. Tampa's got some potential. you got Cameron Bray. You've got Mike Evans. Jameis Winston's a young guy. There should be talent there. You've got a, you know, a, one of the best linebackers in the NFL. But they still are who their record says they are. They are still a four-win team. And that doesn't mean that they can't come in and beat New Orleans. But if New Orleans plays New Orleans football and executes Mm -hmm. at the same level they have all year, they should have no problem. It doesn't mean Tampa can't do it. But I don't think anybody looking at this from the outside or even those of us who study the tape from the inside would give the Bucs the edge in this game. Yeah, arguably they should should win rather easily. I mean, it's – listen, it's – from a, it's it's got to be wholeheartedly distracting. Not only because it, it seems like even when even when they played us last, their season wasn't going well. You could see the frustration from players like Mike Evans during that game, which is why he pounced on Marshawn Lattimore. Yeah. That there was frustration from them losing. You fast forward seven, six, seven games, and they've only won maybe one game in that time span. They've been slightly competitive, and the competition, the competitive wise, came from a. Uh, a division game, which typically you see from division games, but this looks like a team that is ready to pack it up. And then they're going versus a team that still has something to prove in a way of still looking for that perfect game. I think the saints are still looking for that perfect game. And I think that this could be the combination of things happening, them tuning up at the right time in the season, that this could be the game where they wholeheartedly dominate on both offense, defense, and in special teams area of the field. I'm looking for this game to be a blowout in Tampa. Well, and here's another thing that, and for those who don't follow Tampa, even though they're our division rival, uh, you also got to consider that they're not a deep team. So when we talk about them having pieces, you know, when we talk about the Cameron Brates and stuff, they don't have a lot of people behind, you know. So you look yeah. at their. Look who's been injured for them and who's on IR. You talk about O.J. Howard, the rookie. He's on IR. Uh, Ali Marpet and um, J.R. Sweezy, their guards are on IR. They've lost a tackle to IR and DeMar Dodson. Uh, Noah Spence, one of their defensive ends, is on IR. I mean, And then Vernon Hargreaves, one of their corners, that one of the few corners people probably know his name, he's on IR. I mean – so their problem mm-hmm. isn't also that necessarily lack of talent in every area. It's just they didn't they suffer from the same problem the Saints did a couple years ago. They have no depth. So when guys do get injured and they do get 15 guys or 20 guys on IR, they don't have the talent to step up and make up for that. So I, I, I think that's one of the issues with the Bucks is not that we're trying to downplay that they have no talent, it's that they don't have talent deep enough through the roster. And one of the things that you can look at it mm-hmm. is look how they're performing so far. I mean, New Orleans Everybody would agree has had injury problems along the offensive line, you know, and that's been a consistent problem all year. But people have stepped up because the Saints are averaging 132 yards rushing this year. But yet there's been mm-hmm. injuries everywhere. Kamara got a concussion. Ingram's been battling injuries. Hot, basically, everybody on the offensive line has been hurt. There's always been somebody to step up while somebody recovered. I think we'd all agree to that. Tampa is averaging less than 90 yards a game. They have some talent when you look at their rushing attack, but when most of that talent is injured and there's nobody to step up for them, they're going to struggle the rest of the year. And I think that's the point they're at this year. There's still grit there. They want to win. I just don't think they have the talent to do it. Yeah, so I'm going to throw out some 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 facts here, some things here, and then Hit you em. tell me how you feel about it. So Drew has only thrown three TDs here. It was versus Carolina. Yeah. Mike Thomas has zero multi-TD games this year after having two last year. Now, as I look at the books, the Bucks are sixth in TDs giving, given up to wide receivers. And they're also first in yards allowed to wide receivers. Now, they rank middle of the pack as far as what they've allowed to quarterbacks. But Drew, B- Drew Brees will be the best quarterback they've faced all year besides having faced Drew Brees. Um, previously, and outside of Matt Ryan. They haven't really faced pro of quarterbacks this year. And then you go against the issues they've been having in the secondary, which stands for itself and what they've given up to wide receivers. I look for both of those things to actually shake free. I look for my, Michael Thomas to have his first multi, uh, game, multi-TD game of the season. And I look for Drew Brees to throw three TDs or more 
versus the Bucks on top of actually winning or completing or finishing the season with the highest um, completion percentage and setting the NFL record. I again. think this is a great game uh, again. Um, I, gr- I think this is a great game for the Saints offense, a final tune-up game, not to mention the offense Saints, Sean Payton in general, has Mike Smith's number, who is also the defensive coordinator for the Buccaneers. So I think offensively, this is a game where you can see the 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 offense kind of, you know, fixing things. Like I think this is a game where the the third down percentage goes up. I think this is a game where Drew throws multiple TDs, more than two. Um, I also still think it's a game where the running backs still get going. Offensively, I look for this to be a bigger game as far as output based on what we've gotten so far from the offense this year. I'm a yes and no on that one. I think that the early game, the uh, first half, will start off like that. But I think once the game is in hand, you're going to see that basically all go away. So for me, I I see Drew having like a two TD, 240-yard game. Uh, But most of that coming in the first half, and all of us Saints fans are high-fiving on Twitter and everything, talking about how great they are. Uh, And that could have changed, of course. I just One thing I have not seen from Sean Payton this year is he's never – put his cleats in somebody's throat. He's not run up the score or anything. Once the game's in hand, he stops. For mm-hmm. whatever reason, whether he's just trying to keep guys healthy because, you know, those big plays can also result in big injuries, things like that. For whatever reason, he doesn't really do that this year. And it hasn't hurt us. I mean, we're, we're hopefully going to win 12 games, so no big deal. But uh, mm-hmm. I agree with the, the deficiencies that you see with Tampa – would lean towards having that. But then if you also look at how many rushing yards they're allowing, they're allowing almost 120 rushing yards a game. So they're, they're not exactly good against the run either. Uh, I think yeah. that you'll see a mixed bag. I think the saints will come out firing in the beginning. And, you know, like you said, this will be one of those things where they try to prime up their offense and their defense to get ready for the playoffs. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily see it being a huge day for Thomas and Breeze. Because if it goes according to plan, much like how it went the first game where New Orleans was just demolishing Tampa, mm-hmm. instead of keeping your starters in like you did on that game, this game you, you start sitting those guys down. Fair assessment. I actually didn't give much thought to sitting them uh, if things go uh, as according to plan. Um, so how about this? How about we do an over-under on Breeze touchdown passes? You say two, I say three. Okay. Emily Bet again? I still owe you two I'll Oreos and a Jolly Rancher. You're about to probably owe me. But this time I want the vanilla. So I'm going to take okay. a six. I'm going to bet a six-pack of vanilla Oreos, the thin kinds. I don't like a lot of cream. Um, thin, and that's where we'll go. Anything you want to throw out there, sir? Uh, anything you would like just in case you win, which I don't think you will, but just in case you do. If I win, if I win, you have to go baby face. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. If you win, I will shave you. There you go. All right, guys. If, we're go- <laughs> if you will shave <laughs> We're we're going to we're going to get into um, question and answer time. So if you got questions, throw them in. I saw Hunter Canterbury had one. I definitely want to get to his Hunter. If you're still around, if you've got a question, throw it out there. Matthew says so. The Bucks have played ATL and the Panthers till last seconds to go. We shouldn't look past them. My rebuttal is the Saints have dominated division opponents. Regardless, I mean Atlanta is the only one that kept it close, and that was one game. And and at mm-hmm. home, that wasn't close at all. And usually any other year, I'm with you, man. And I'm not saying sleep on the Bucks. I'm saying play the Bucks extremely hard. I'm just simply saying if they play the Bucks hard like they should and don't sleep on them, they're going to dominate this game. They're a much better team than Tampa. Now, if they stop executing well, if they start sleeping on themselves, sure. You know, the Bucks can start running this game close, but I don't see that happening. One thing we've seen from New Orleans this year is they've been a disciplined team all year long. You can't really point to a lot of games where they just are slipping up. So that's my take anyway. One question we're going to get. Hunter says, and this is one I've heard, he says he thinks the Rams are trying to dodge Minnesota by resting starters this week. Would we rather play Minnesota or Philly? Both are tough to play, assuming New Orleans and the Rams both win the wild card round. First off, I don't believe the Rams are resting starters because they're scared. I think that's something that, Riders are pushing because it's a great story and it gets a lot of clicks. 
I think the Rams and Sean McVay are confident that they can beat either the Vikings or Philly because either is going to be an away game. And Sean McVay thinks it's smarter to have my guys healthy and rest my stars so they don't get injured in a meaningless game because you're going to, the Rams are going to host a home game regardless. And there's nothing that the Rams can do to host in the divisional round. Nothing. So their fate is basically mm-hmm. sealed. I think McVay simply doesn't care where he has to go. He just wants a healthy team to do it because the Rams have one of the healthiest rosters in the NFL. And I don't know if they're necessarily as deep as a team like New Orleans has shown. So they need to preserve that health. I I don't buy into the any team is scared of another team. And to answer the second part of your question, who do I fear the most? Both. I think any team that makes it to the playoff is good enough to beat you. I think Philly, I don't care. People will say – Nick Foles isn't Carson Wentz. Nick Foles took the Eagles to the playoffs by himself. Now he's got a better defense and weapons on offense. And I'm not saying Nick Foles is going to take him to the Super Bowl. I'm simply saying I haven't knocked the Eagles down my rankings. The Eagles are still the best team in the NFC until proven otherwise. So I think there's no fear about it for me. you got to go in and beat either one of them no matter who it is, and I don't think the Rams care. I think the Rams are trying to play it safe that they're as healthy as possible for the playoffs. Yeah, I don't see us trying to take the path of least resistance, per se. Um, I thought that was interesting. I think Duncan kind of hinted at that. I don't, I don't know that that's something that you do. I mean, you listen, for, for 17 weeks of the season, you play who's given to you on your schedule. I don't see you trying to manipulate that in the playoffs by saying, hey, I'm going to lose here or let's try and go here. You play who you get. And that's what you look forward to. Personally, if I had to choose between which team, I would rather play Philly. I would rather play Philly because there's a lot of players on that team individually that mean something to them that we have scouting reports on. We've got a scouting report on Patrick Robinson. We know who Malcolm Jenkins is. We know who uh, Jay Ajayi is at this point in the season. Nick Foles is not uh, their previous quarterback. Can't think about his name right now. It slips me. Carson Wentz. So I would rather play i would rather play the eagles at the moment um mainly because their strengths actually play into some of our strengths um pass defense we have on lock the vikings are more run oriented and we have issues uh, in run defense so yeah i would i would take philly all day right now all day and see like if i was making matchups i think the rams have the better chance to take down minnesota uh, no, I agree. I actually do. So, I mean, I, I think and they have a much I, I, I see Thane saying that they have something to play for, but honestly, coaches really aren't looking two weeks ahead. I mean, I don't know any coach that does that. They look for this week. I mean, Bill Belichick is famous for not doing that. I mean, if you want to succeed in this league, you think about the next game and what you can do, and, and that's what – I feel like Sean Mavey is saying, and unless a coach or player for the Rams come out and say that they are trying to make the the Philly game happen, and even if it takes a year for it to to be said, I don't believe it. Nobody I've ever spoken to in the NFL has ever hinted that that is how they play football, ever. I mean, so I just don't side on that. I think that is one of those things that analysts and and writers push because fans are going to eat it up because everybody likes drama i just don't think there's any drama there i think that's something that people are making up just to write a story personally so oh my boy elias you freeze we'll we'll get you back elias don't worry look at you come back Anyway, next question we're going to grab because we, we got to get questions. Matthew says, schedule manipulation can play in the championships. Ask Nick Saban and Michigan. Hey, I don't think college football playoffs and how those things are doing have anything to do with the NFL. Raphael says, I haven't seen any Vikes games other than week one. Are they that good? Yes, because their defense yeah. is that good. I mean, it, it's scary. They have the best safety in the NFL right now, good corners, and a good front seven. And, and – individually they have one of the best defensive ends and then they have one of the best linebackers yeah they're stacked all the way through that defense and they've got some good offensive pieces enough offensive pieces to where they lost their starting running back and quarterback and haven't missed a beat so yeah they are that good if you get the number two and number one seed you're that good yeah yeah they they are as stacked and as well coached as they can play because any team can have talent. Then there are some teams that have good coaches and don't have talent. 
Um, the Vikings have drafted well the last few years, and their head coach does a good job making sure those guys, especially on defense, are in proper position. They have a good scheme, um, the Vikings do. And I think it presents a lot of problems for who we want to be as an offense because they they tend to limit teams' explosiveness. Um, they have the, the safety play uh, that they can get that can limit teams, what they do down the field, how we attack. The Vikings are definitely a threat. They're just as weak to healthy running back as they will be later in the season now. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, people sleep on their offense. I see Brian Maduku over here sleeping on their offense, but they're a top 10 offense in points scored and yards. I mean, people say, uh, like Brian says, that he's not scared of their offense. Their offense is scary. I mean, <laughs> their offense is scary. I mean, it, when you combine it with that defense, too, that offense only has to score 20, 25 points because that defense isn't giving up a 30-burger. I can't think of the last game they did, and they've probably only done a couple times. They've given up like 240 points all year. I mean, it, they're having a good year, man. <laughs> Let me ask this. Who, who won? Uh, did the Vikings play the Panthers? Yes. Who won that game? Um, they lost to the Panthers. Very close. Okay. I will stick to this assessment. This is how I felt for quite some time. This is how I will continue to feel. The best team in the NFC will come from the best division in the NFC. The best division in the NFC right now is the NFC South. While the Vikings are the tougher out, yeah, I still think the Saints are better than those teams. I think they're better coach-wise. And I think in some areas, as far as what they do, they're better than those teams. And mm -hmm. I think competition is uh, you, you you have metal sharpening metal here. You've got them going against the Panthers and the Falcons. Um, I do believe that the Saints are still the best. Now, now, can they do that week in and week out consistently? That's the thing versus the opponent because any team is beatable. But I still think the Saints are easily the best, and not to say that easily, but I just feel like just from a strategic standpoint and just from a logical standpoint that they are the best team in the NFC. I think that I think there's validity to that argument. I always go as far as to say that if the Saints have managed to get home field advantage throughout, then they're unstoppable based on how they've played yeah. most of this season. But that's not the case. So I think, especially when it comes to playoffs, field uh, home field advantage really does play a, a role. I mean, we've seen the percentages where home teams usually do win out most of the time. So, uh, I mean, it's tougher for you being on the road. Now, that said, it's been done. Uh, and I don't think that the Saints can't do it. I think that, like I said, all year, get into the dance. That's all that matters. Any team in the playoffs can beat any other team. The Los Angeles Chargers, who are fighting for the number six seed in the AFC, can run the table and go all the way. They can do it if they're good enough to get in the playoffs. All you got to do is get there. And I think the Saints are good enough to make that run. I concur, sir. Of course I concur. I started it. Brandon says, <laughs> and guys, remember, if we miss your question, just throw it back in and we'll grab it. Brandon says, if we play Carolina in the first round of the playoffs, do you think we would have the advantage over them? Certainly I think we'd have the advantage. Yes. I would add that playing them three times in a season – as a level of difficulty that you cannot attribute to the first two games. Um, it is, uh, I think I saw somebody else make the comment that how accurate is the narrative that it's tough to beat three team, a team three times. It, there is a lot of validity to it. That said, the Saints not only won the first two games, they won the first two games handedly. And I would argue right. that the Carolina Panthers are weaker now based on injuries that have been happening in the year than they were earlier. I still think the Panthers are a good team. And the odd thing is that we're the anomaly. The Panthers seem to play everybody else really well. I mean, the Panthers have a good shot of going 12-4 and four, just like the New Orleans Saints do, yet their two losses came against the Saints. Uh, so it's kind of odd that that's happened. So I do believe that you – you know, you have to say the Saints have a significant advantage there because they've proven it. You know, that quote I gave you guys a week ago, if somebody shows you who they are, believe them. I think the Saints are a much better team than Carolina. But I'll also say that when it comes to studying film, it's going to be a lot tougher to beat them the third time than it was the first two times. I still think the Saints can do it, and I would be very surprised if they, if they lost to the Panthers. But I wouldn't see it being a 2-3 a score blowout like it was those first two games. Fair assessment. I, I think it would be closer, and yet – uh, based on the points that you spoke to, I do think the Saints would still win. But I also like them coming to us in the Dome again because the fans and this team has, as you mentioned, 
shown up for division opponents this year. If they've they've done a number on every divisional opponent they face. And so I would have no problem with them having to come to the dome and having to face them three times. I'd be confident in the team showing up. I'd be confident in the cho- coaches coming up with a good game plan. I'd be confident in the fans showing up and making it hard on Newton and the Panthers. So I agree. It wouldn't it would be slightly harder, but it would be a very winnable game. Very very winnable. Mike Allen saying, are we concerned with our running game showing signs of decline versus how we were running the ball during our win streak? I, I would argue that you haven't seen any decline. I mean, what games can you really point out? And this is a legitimate question. I mean, we don't ask fans this in terms of hate or anything or disagreement, but what would you say the Saints struggle with? Because a lot of people I know are going to point to Atlanta. Well, Atlanta is a top 10 defense and one of the best defenses in the NFL. They're going to slow down the run game. Yet that run game still scored. The screen game still worked. You know, it might have slowed down the team, but I don't think it stopped it. I mean, I think that's a very big thing to keep in mind there, that you're not playing the Buffalo Bills every week who are at the end of their rope and dying. You know, sometimes you play a good defense. I mean, and if you look just the week before that against the New York Jets, the Saints had 130 rush yards. The only struggles they've had, in, the, in recent weeks, or to Atlanta twice. And Kamara got injured the first game, and then they were both healthy this past game, and both Ingram and Kamara had significant impact in the game, and they helped win it. So I wouldn't say that the, the Saints' running game has struggled. They simply played an elite defense, and that's what slowed them down. Yeah, and, you know, because, because the running game, especially with the Saints, because you have, you know, things like the screen game or short passes that are more of an extension, of the running game, I think you have to take prop off as far as as specific runs with the grain of salt, regardless of the fact that versus the Atlanta last week, uh, Kamara and Ingram still went for like, like 76 yards combined on the ground. But then when you add in what they did in the air, and which is for another 80 yards, there was absolutely no drop off in those two players individually. How they got the yards. Um, by traditional was not necessarily as high reaching as it was, but as a unit, as a tandem, as far as production from the runners, those guys have not dropped off in a single bit. The teams and what the teams are able to do to stop them has caused them to maybe see a drop off as far as what they were able to produce. But as far as being like the, what they've done all year, as far as being the engine that runs that caboose, they've been doing that consistently and have not stopped in the least bit. Kamara and Ingram are still very much a threat. It's just that they can do it to you on the ground and in the air. But regardless, they're finishing over 100 yards from scrimmage every game, regardless. Yeah, I mean, here's another one for you guys. The Saints have yet to to play a game this year where they had less than 300 yards of total offense. Not a single one. And the, this Falcons game last week where they really started to run the clock out, try to just eat the game away. They end up with like 315, which I think is their lowest. Compare that to last year when they went 7-9. and nine, They had, I think, four games where they failed to reach 300 yards offensively. Maybe it was five, but I know it's at least four. I'm, I'm looking at it right here. Uh, let's see. Total yards, one, two, three. Yeah, so three games and then really close on a fourth where they failed to get 300 yards in a losing season. The Saints have been consistent, man. I mean, the 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 Jets game, a lot of people say, well, it wasn't consistent. A lot of that's that 50-yard run. But all of it adds up. I mean, they were consistent. They were efficient. And then you got to add in the receiving yards that these running backs have because they are an extension of the run game. Uh, next Absolutely. question I want to grab, because we're 39 minutes in, and we're going to try to start wrapping up the show. But we will be back after the game. Kevin says, "What's on? who's on the roster next year, Vaccaro or Okafor? This is something that uh, me and Elias have kind of gone back and forth with a lot this year. We both agree that Okafor is going to get an offer, uh, but I think that his performance is going to justify a pretty decent contract. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Now, we disagree on the Vaccaro situation. I believe you keep Vaccaro. Elias tends to side more towards the let him go and just replace it. Uh, for me, I'm of the mind, don't make a hole in the defense that you don't have to. Offer him a team-friendly deal. I think he'll accept it. Uh, don't. Uh, I think me and Elias are both in agreement, don't offer him a high-dollar safety deal, which is what a lot of people around the league might do. Don't do that. Nothing around $7, 8000000 a year. 
But I think a team-friendly $4 million type year, maybe $5 million a year, I'm fine with. I think the Saints will offer him that. Uh, Elias, I don't know where you're sitting at now. I know a couple of weeks ago you were kind of against that too. I mean, I'm – I don't think when when you go into free agency with a player like that, that the, the main problem I have is Vaccaro has a, a litany of injuries over his career at this point. Um, there's a good chance on top of that, that if he does anything, you lose him for 10 games. So you've got, you've got issues on that end with him. But since there's not to go so deep, since there's confusion, I think since it's easier to agree on Okafor, and then it's it's a it's more of a debate with Vaccaro. Obviously, mm-hmm. I think the answer here to the question is Okafor has a higher chance of being on the team next year. Um, be fine with keeping Vaccaro. I just think that there are better options out there for what you want to do at the safety position because you're not necessarily creating a hole losing him. You still, even with him on the roster, you still need a slot DB. Yeah, but with him on the roster, you still need a legit safety too. So walking away from him to get a legit safety is not actually creating a hole in the defense. That's just my opinion. Um, But yeah. Anthony Jordan says, do we think the saints playing the Panthers with Lattimore would make a difference? Not at all. Uh, the, the, The way that the Panthers offense was able to be effective in limited fashion was Christian McCaffrey. That's basically it. That guy in the flats is going to kill the saints and he's going to kill basically every team. I mean, we don't have the linebackers to cover him, and there's ways to shut him out in other ways. But, you know, Crawley, Lattimore, they're going to handle the receivers. I don't think Lattimore playing against the Panthers makes a big of a difference. Now, if you can resurrect A.J. Klein and Alex Anzalone in 2017, that makes a difference playing the Panthers. But uh, I don't think Lattimore playing uh, really makes that much more of a difference, personally. No, I mean, they, they don't have the receiving options to where it, it'd be like, oh, we need Lattimore. I think the, the scheme that Dennis Allen runs, which might I add just randomly to go off subject. Early in the year, we had this argument about um the Saints and, and tight ends. And I recall saying that the tight end, the Saints defense versus the tight end had improved. And I recall the argument being that, well, the reason it improved was because there were so many other areas uh, that teams could attack that they didn't even have to really attack tight end. Mm-hmm. So I went and looked at some stats today while while going for the uh, while looking up some Buccaneers things. And the Saints are the top two team in the league versus the tight end again after. And it, it was Very an improvement nice. over last year where they were like top seven or top ten. Very um, nice. That is like they've shut down a tight end all year. Random. Just wanted to throw it out there. Little tidbit. No, no. What you wanted point. to do was humble brag and say Deuce was wrong, and that's fine. I'm not right on everything. It happens. False, man. No, False. it, it was is, a humble that is brag. Such a fabrication. It was a humble brag, but it, it, it's okay. We still love you. Josh wants to know: Do we think that the Saints should come out passing more than compared to running? I personally say no. Your run game is much better than your pass game, and it's worked all year. Rely on it. That doesn't mean don't pass. But the Saints, I think, right now are the second best team in the NFL on rushing on first down. Run the football. I don't know. That's a that's a good question because the Buccaneers' pass defense, as we talked about earlier, as far as what they've given up to receivers, is pretty woeful. I, that's a good. I think. But I think so is their run defense. You can pretty much. Yeah, you can pretty much attack them any kind of way. I think that's why we're in agreement that the offense should have a good game because yeah. they can attack them pretty much in in every area. And their strength ends up going against the Buccaneers' weakness. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of pick your poison with that one. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> if if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That run game yeah, has enough. been unstoppable all year. Let it stay that way. If you got to rely on the pass, I, I like the pass is still – extremely good and you can go to it if you want like one one of my favorite things this year is the saints lead the nfl in yards after catch in receptions yet if you look at their passing yards they're not at the top of the league i think that's phenomenal they have more yards after the catch than the los angeles rams do and that's something that the rams get a lot of love for but they don't have to rely on that it's that secret weapon in the bag of tricks it's that you pull it out and then you hit that bomb to ted Ginn on play action that's what i like Yep, that, that's where my side yep. is. Let me grab a couple more of these before we wrap it up. 
Um, let's see. Brandon had a question. Where was it? I won't forget. It. He says, "How impressed are y'all with our DBs?" It is hands down the best defensive back group yeah. that we've had since 2011. Yeah, hands down. Did, I don't, is there I, any, any I, debate? Out, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, to me, the past. Lattimore's a Pro Bowler. Was, yeah. Marcus Williams is playing as an above average rookie. Von Bell has been better at strong safety than even I expected. And I said he needed to move to strong safety this year to be effective. And then Ken Crawley is a top 20 corner in the league. I mean, you could argue that there's what, maybe two, three DB groups in the NFL that are better as a whole. But yeah, I mean, extremely impressed. I would if I I would say it's it's close to 2013 because the and the reason I say it is because the 2013 defense versus the pass was I think at one point before Greer went down like the number f- four ranked uh, defensive back group and to me when I compared we we had we had um Keenan Keenan Lewis we mm-hmm. had Jabari starting across from him you had Malcolm Jenkins dropping down in the slot you had Bush playing deep safety and then you have Vaccaro playing the slot. So across the board, your top four cover, four cover players were Vaccaro, Greer, uh, uh, the, the, the Jenkins, and then Lewis. That was a lot of talent there. Yeah. So now your top four cover guys, and if you were to do everyone healthy, would have been Lattimore, Crawley, Vaccaro, and then PJ Williams. And I would say that that from a productivity, from talent, is pretty close to that 2013. Here, here's my counter, though. Defense. Here's why they're better than 2013. They're Run much it. better at, at forcing turnovers from the DB position. Ah, no, no, yeah, that's because one it's good And as, I think that has everything to do with Allen yeah. as a coach. I think, I think, what's his name? Rob Ryan had better talent in the back end, but I think DA's scheme is just so much better. Like we've got a number of dropped interceptions and unrecovered fumbles this year that will go untalked about. Like this team is already a top unit as far as turnovers. If they could have gotten more turnovers, they'd be one of the best. And that all has to do with who's the guy calling the shots and putting the players in position. And so for that, yes, overall, they are better than, the 2013, but from a talent standpoint, I'd have to say that the 2013 team had a little bit more talent in the secondary. I could see your argument, but then I, I would counter with PJ Williams has been really good from the slot. PJ Williams has come in and start this year and look fine. I mean, so I, I, I don't know. You, you might be able to say that maybe the top end of the talent was better in 2013, maybe, but I would then counter again with this year's group is deeper at DB. Yeah, no, like, like if I lose, you lose Jabari Greer, 2013's done. It's barbecue chicken. It's yeah, toast. that's white jumping in, right. You, you lose Lattimore, you're fine. You, you would rather have Lattimore, but we've won without Lattimore. And I'm not saying Lattimore is expendable. Not at all. <laughs> Don't take that and misconstrue what I said. Just pointing out there's a lot of depth here. We're going to get one more question for you in the show. One more. And Thane, I'm not forgetting about the 09 secondary. I said the sa- this year is the best since 09. We're not forgetting about 09. We, we just got 13 thrown in there. Um, but last question that we're going to grab is from Kevin. Do we break the bank to bring Brees back for two years, or do we shoot our shot for Kirk Cousins? I think that they're going to keep Drew Brees, and it'll be interesting to see how they do that contract because uh, they have to push out that $18 million cap hit a little bit more. But how long do you really want to commit to keeping him? But I do think they go Drew Brees, and then I think they draft a young quarterback and uh, to learn behind him. I'm not sold on Taysom Hill, though. I'd love for him to be that story. Do you agree? I do agree. I concur with that. I, listen, I think I don't think you want to mess with the synastry that you have between play co- play caller and quarterback. I, I would I will take Sean Payton and Drew over Sean Payton and the young quarterback from the Redskins any day. Just because they've been with each other for so long, they know what the other is thinking. You don't want to really mess with that synastry. All right. Well, look, guys, we're going to wrap up the show. Don't forget that Sunday after the game, and that game has been flexed to a 325 game, so we'll be with you a little bit later on Sunday. You'll have time to go to church on Sunday morning. I'll be proud of you all. 
We will be here. <laughs> we will be repping for the New Orleans Saints after that game. We'll be breaking it down after it happens for a full post-game show. Don't miss it. That should happen, what, around 6.30? Whenever the game ends, about 10 to 15 minutes after the game is where we'll be. If you missed any part of the show, don't forget that you can catch it on iTunes, Google Play, or go watch it on YouTube. You can see all y'all's comments. So everything that y'all are saying right there in the comments, you can go see yourself talk. And be warned, though, the YouTube crowd, they'll call you out. I mean, they're not fans of some of you commenters out there. So maybe it'll be fun to see you, uh, y'all you interact with each other. But we love y'all the same, regardless of your opinion, because we appreciate everybody in Houdat Nation. God bless. We'll see you in the next episode. Elias, wrap us up and bake. Yeah, so do remember, we have the 325 game, so we'll be on a little later. So please, you have to, you know, we'll be more like dessert rather than lunch on Sunday. So just make sure you leave a little room in your belly for a little bit of dessert, a little bit of Rev and Elias uh, to catch you up on what we're expecting to be another W after facing the Bucks. And so we would like to be able to wrap that up with a, uh, a who that NFC South party, however we'll decide to approach it. Yeah. Um, regardless, make sure you come back. Sunday. Um, follow us on Twitter at Rev Deuce Wyndham, at Elias J. Williams. Check us out on Canal Street Chronicles. We normally have articles. Or in, in Rev's case, he has the uh, the videos for you for his how, what's the word I'm looking for? Scouting reports as far as checking out different games. Check Rev out for that. Like He's got football information for decades. I've just got all the insight and stuff like things that people don't think about. Rev's got the knowledge. So if you like what we're doing here, make sure you join us. Share us out next time. We enjoy having you. And um, again, we will see you on Sunday after a Saints win. Peace. Who that?